You're listening to The Resilient Animal. I'm Annie Peterson, Doctor of Education with a Master's in Mental Health Recovery and Trauma-Informed Care. This podcast is an exploration of how helping other living beings can benefit mental health and what makes us all resilient animals. In this conversation, I speak with Lori Beaven, founder of Libby Lou's Safe Haven, a nonprofit focused on rescuing cows and other animals from the meat and dairy industries. Lori shares her personal journey explaining how Libby Lou, a miniature Hereford heifer, helped her through her depression, leading to the creation of the sanctuary. She discusses the harsh realities of the dairy and beef industries, highlighting the need for rescuing cows. Lori also discusses the challenges and financial strains of running an animal sanctuary in Southern California. This conversation offers insights into the human-animal bond, the significance of creating sanctuaries, and raises awareness about the plight of farm animals. Um, Welcome, everybody, and thank you for listening to The Resilient Animal. Today, we're talking with Lori Beaven from from Libby Lou Safe Haven. And thank you so much for being here with us today, Lori. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Lori, I was just hoping we've known each other for a while, (laughs) a couple years now. And for any of you that are interested in, in seeing Lori and her property, we have done a, or actually her former property. We've done a, a couple of Animal Bond Academy episodes with her. You can catch those on YouTube. But today we're just going to talk with her about her her history and what led her to founding this really amazing nonprofit. So first of all, Lori, who, who is Libby Lou? Libby Lou is a miniature Hereford heifer. Okay, and so for us city folk, what's a heifer? <laughs> it is a female bovine that has not had a baby. So I, I talked to a lot of people who have founded nonprofits with dogs and cats and, and all of that. Why did you decide to to found a nonprofit with a, a cow? I've always liked cows. I always when I would see them along the roadside as a child, I always thought they were beautiful. And they look so gentle. But of course, I had no clue on how you would ever take care of one. But just there's a need for rescue for cows. And a lot of people don't understand that. They just think, well, they're in the the food production industry. Why would they need rescuing? Well, to me, if they haven't already been rescued, all of them need rescuing. And something that I've learned a lot about from you is somebody who has, I've personally definitely gotten off of red meat, and it was because I met some of your cows. And so it's hard to then turn around and and eat that particular animal after you've actually met them and spent some time with them. And one thing I didn't really think about, because I thought I was being so good not or you know, just not eating red meat, but just sticking with cheese and and milk or other kind of dairy products. So what, what is it about the, the dairy industry that made you really want to start rescuing animals from the dairy industry as well? Well, the, the dairy industry is actually just as bad or worse than the beef industry. The female cows at the dairies are forced to get pregnant every year. And then, I mean, literally within minutes of giving birth, that child of theirs is taken away. So the dairy can have the milk that is meant for the child. And it it just, to me, is a cruel, cruel industry when the cows are spent, meaning they can no longer produce milk in their older ages. They are sent to slaughter. The male calves, since they cannot produce milk, are considered a waste product and are could be killed within a day or two of birth, or they become veal. So, and then the the female calves just get it's just a vicious cycle. They become this that same animal that their mom is and go through the same process over and over and over. 
So once I really understood all that, I saw a great need to also help calves in the dairy industry. So, and speaking of that, can you talk to us a little bit about Augie Norman, which is uh, an individual that I have, he's so handsome. (laughs) He really is. Really? He is growing into a very handsome young man. (laughs) So, So can you tell us a little bit about about Augie Norman and what his his situation was when you got him. Sure. Well, he he is a Jersey, so that's just that's a, a breed of dairy cow. He was born on a dairy in Northern California, and because he was male, he was not going to meet a good ending. He was rescued along with some other boy calves, and I was lucky enough to be chosen to adopt him. He was in foster up by UC Davis for two months. I got him when he was a little short of three months old. And he needed bottle feeding three to four times a day. He slept in my my laundry room for three months on a dog bed. And he would go out in the barn in his day room during the day. And... He, he had been doing well when he was little, but then he started having breathing issues, severe breathing issues. Sounded a little bit like asthma. The vet here really couldn't get a handle on it and refused to do diagnostics. So he ended up, we were fortunate enough to get referred to a vet out of Los Angeles. And she drove down here and did x-rays and an ultrasound under a tree. And within 15 minutes, had a an honest diagnosis of him. He's in congestive heart failure due to his heart is double the size it should be. And it's a genetic birth defect that's unfortunately pretty common, I, I'm hearing, in dairies because of inbreeding. So, and surprise, surprise, there's no medication for cows because in the production industry, he would just be killed. So she luckily is progressive enough. We're trying him on dog medication for his heart. And he's been on it for over a year now. And he's also on uh, the human drug Lasix, which is a diuretic to clear him of the excess liquid. And he's doing wonderful. She said, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Because he'll be three this year, which is a miracle. He's cheated death twice. So far, she, and she said, honestly, we don't know his life expectancy because she isn't uh, aware of any other uh, situation where a cow is being uh, treated with the, this dog medication. So every day that he is with me is a blessing. I remember when you first got him, he just was a little, he was such a little pea. <laughs> And every, and I remember you posting photos of him and, and just for those of you who are listening, definitely go on to Libby Lou's social, Libby Lou's social media because it's, it's just so adorable. I can't stand it. So. Yeah. You met him um, the first day he came home. Yeah. He, I think he had gotten, to, was it like one in the morning they drove up and, Yes. Dropped him off at your house and you had a very long day. And then we had a news crew come out that same day. And it was just, there was a lot. It (laughs) was was a lot, lot but it was amazing. But can you just talk to us a little bit about how, how Libby Lou is really, how she, she saved you in a way. And that's something that you've mentioned. And actually you have it on your, your, a really good story about that on your website. Sure. So I had had depression off and on throughout my life. Just when when tough times, it's, it's, it's easy to get down sometimes, but it was just the, the cumulation of just a lot of stuff throughout my life, a lot of hard times, some abuse, some tragedy, and just the loss of a lot of people in my life. And when I lost my parents, within three weeks of each other, that, that was the tipping point for me and got really depressed and just felt like I was going to have a breakdown, honestly. And I was living in San Diego and I just decided 
as much as I love it here, I had to get out. So we picked up, we put the house on the market, picked up, moved to Colorado. I needed some open space and some fresh mountain air. And I decided that that was my opportunity. We had, we got a home with three acres and, and maybe I could have a cow. And I thought, well, maybe I should get a mini because that's not a lot of room. So I did research for six months. I talked to a lot of people, vets, ranchers, did a lot of computer research on, on how to care for a cow. And um, I found Libby. She is a, she came from a show cattle ranch, but she, she was not a top finisher. They, they would have a grand champions, blue ribbon winners. And uh, she was not one of those. So she was basically expendable. So I adopted her and throughout that first year together, I spent a lot of, a lot, a lot of time with her. And I was, I was able to talk to her about how I was feeling. And sometimes it's hard to talk to people, but it's easier to talk to animals. And she was a good listener and she just got me through all that. And I came out the other end, a stronger person. And to thank her, I decided to, to start Libby Lou's safe haven, name it after her and try to help animals of her kind. And that, that was the, the best way I could think of to, to really, truly show my gratitude to her. Yeah. And so I know, I know a couple of years ago when I, oh my gosh, four years ago now, <laughs> when I first met you, you were either, either the only one or one of the only rescue groups in Southern California that was 100% committed to saving animals from the meat and dairy industry. Is that correct? Is, or, and is that still current? I still believe I'm one of the few cow sanctuaries in Southern California. There are many wonderful farm sanctuaries and but they don't predominantly focus on cows. Whereas I am a cow sanctuary first. That's why it's a cows and friends sanctuary. And so how many do you have now? How many have you rescued so far? We have 12 cows. And then we also have three donkeys and seven chickens. So those are the friends. So, and I love, oh, I love your donkeys. I love them. And so can you tell us a little bit, is it, I'm sorry, is it Mrs. T or Mr. T? Miss T. I'm so sorry. Miss T. <laughs> Miss T. So tell us a little bit about her and her breed and just kind of her her really cool background. Sure. History. I love talking about her. Her breed is a mammoth jackstock donkey. She's 100% purebred. That is the largest donkey breed in the world. So she's very 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 big her head is the size of a draft horse she's about 16.1 hands tall and i adopted her from a facility that i was volunteering for in colorado the breed is somewhere between rare and endangered and it originated actually back in colonial times george washington was the first person to have them in this country. He was gifted them from the king or queen of Spain. So he started them here and they would, they were used to pull plows and, and they were working animals back then. But then with the machinery and such, they just became obsolete and they were slaughtered. So th there's just not too many of them left, unfortunately. So in adopting her, I just wanted to make sure that she wasn't ridden. She has some arthritis, just like very large dogs can have arthritis issues. Same with her. I didn't want her to be in a petting zoo or anywhere that she would be forced to do anything um, that she didn't want to do. And I also thought, she, what a great ambassador she could be for her breed. Because, I mean, I know I had never heard of that breed. I thought she was a, a mule mix or something, but she's a great ambassador here at Libby Lou's because people come here 
predominantly to visit with the cows, but then they meet the donkeys and they have a amazing experience with them as well. And they get educated about a breed that they too have never heard of. So, I mean, she, she's yeah, a blessing. I'd, I'd never heard. Yeah. I'd never heard of that either until I went out and, and visited you. So that was a really cool learning experience for me too. And so what about her, her two buddies that are definitely not as big? As no, she, no, <laughs> they're standard size donkeys, but Compared to her, they look like minis. Uh, their names are Fergie and Sahara. And uh, they're, I call them sisters. They're not blood sisters, but they're a bonded pair. And their bond is so strong. They they do not like being out of each other's sight. And they, they work in unison, eating, drinking, sleeping, walking, laying, grooming. They're, they're really cool to watch. And they're... They're characters. They're ornery and they're funny and they make people smile. And they're they're just a lot of fun. They're great with our guests. I mean, they they light up a room. I mean, they're 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 amazing too. So they've been a great addition to Libby Lose as well. And so when people when people talk about bonded animals, I, I'm glad that you gave those descriptions of of what they do together all the time. Because quite often, especially when people are adopting dogs and cats, they think about, um, well, if they live together, that means they're bonded. And it doesn't necessarily mean that. Right. Living together doesn't mean you're bonded. And so then when people are talking about bonded animals, a lot of times they don't think outside of the the pet world uh -huh. that, that these donkeys can be bonded to. So do you find that a lot of your, I know those two are bonded, are, do you have anybody else that is bonded with another animal, even if it's a different species? Fleetwood, my oldest steer, and Libby Lou. I, I'm not sure I'd say, they may be bonded, but they're certainly best friends. Um. That they hang out all the time together, and Fleetwood is the will let Libby Lou share his hay, and nobody else can do that. So I mean that. I mean she she's definitely number one in his book, and then of course there's the bond between the mama cow and her her child. So I I'm lucky enough to have <laughs> unexpectedly had three babies born at Libby Lou's. Surprise, surprise. So I've been able to see firsthand the bond. People, some people say mama cows don't really care about their children. And that is, couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, I've been able to see the bond and the, the babies are now, they're all going to be three years old this year, which is, I can't believe, but the bond is still so strong. The mama will give them a bath pretty much every day, which is a very good experience for the child to, to get that kind of one-on-one -on -one attention from the mom. And they'll lay together and eat together. So definitely, animals definitely bond with each other, without a doubt. So the first one born on your property was Snowflake, right? Correct. And so just to clarify... Lori and Libby Lou Safe Haven does not breed animals. So can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up with <laughs> all these babies when you're not breeding sure. them? <laughs> well, it was the first group rescue I'd ever done. There was a need for this. It was actually a herd of 11 that were in great danger to go to auction up in Northern California. So, excuse me, I thought, well... If I could take five of them, that's almost half. And it was five females because you absolutely cannot have a bull um, on your property with a bunch of females. So I, and they were, they were about, three of them were a year and a half old and two of them were five years old. And I kept a mother daughter and a mother daughter together. And then the, the fifth was a cousin. So they, they came down. And I, 
I should have asked if they had been exposed to a bull. I will in the future, but I just assumed that if they were pregnant, somebody might have told me, but not, that didn't happen. So, and I've never been around anyone that had been pregnant. I've never seen a birth, any of that. So I was Googling a lot. But it basically, I was seeing the cow's bodies change and I got some pregnancy tests from another sanctuary after Snowflake was born and Wymius came back like uncertain. So that probably meant we were going to have another baby and then everybody else's was negative. So when Doe gave birth to Regan, that was... A huge surprise because that obviously was a false negative. So I really wasn't expecting that baby. The good part of that is it's just been amazing to to actually be there and watch them being born and watch the the mother child bond and watch them grow and all of that. The bad was financially. I had prepared for five new family members, not eight. And I don't adopt out. So they're here for their entire life. And eventually they're going to eat as much hay as their adult mothers. So that I, I quickly did some fundraising. Long term, that adds a lot of stress on, on me to be able to continue to provide for them, which is my promise to everybody that I bring in. So it's, we've had our ups and downs, but all together, I still think of it as a blessing because they'll get to stay with their moms their, all their life. They'll never be separated. And that's what makes you a true sanctuary. Exactly. You know, when people, a lot of times people use the word sanctuary and, and then they end up you know, adopting out animals. And like you said, they're going to stay with you forever. And so you have additional lives on your property. And so you are financially responsible for them. So I do want to talk a little bit about that, about fundraising. And you did a big move recently too, but I'm, I'm going to ask the question that I'm sure a lot of people are, are wondering is how do you give a pregnancy test to a cow? <laughs> You you have to catch the urine cleanly midstream. So you have to be very patient because they and they they get suspicious because you look very silly carrying around a Tupperware watching them. So I it, it took hours, but I learned if they've been laying down for a long time when they're chewing their cud. Once they stand up, they're going to pee. So that's when you've got to be on your toes and ready to go over there and catch that urine. So yeah, cows are smart. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> they're like, she's been following us around with that bucket. Yeah. And I don't know why. And there's something really odd about that. So <laughs> exactly. So yeah, you would be a great resource if someone is trying to figure out how to give. <laughs> so sorry. You're so dedicated, Lori. I love it. <laughs> so you were originally Libby Lou Safe Haven was in Boulevard? Originally, Cal it was in California. Colorado. That's where I oh, started Colorado, it. Right. But I, it takes, I wanted to be legit and I wanted to be a 501c3 and have all my paperwork completed. And that takes months and months. So t I was technically had, I had some animals there and I was working on my paperwork, but I was not open to the public. And then COVID hit. So that, of course, affected us all in so many ways. So I did not really have the sanctuary rolling in Colorado. It's when we moved back because of a family emergency, we moved back to San Diego and we were in Boulevard. And that's in 21 is when May of 21 is when I opened to the public. 
So that's that's when I, I started having guests come and giving tours and doing some humane education, stuff like that. Yeah, so and so for those of you that are listening to this and you might be in Pennsylvania, Boulevard is in Southern California. It's part of San Diego County, is that right, Lori? Yes, is but it's it's way County? out east toward Arizona. Right. So, yeah, if you're if you're driving to Arizona, you one of the first cities you get into when you cross the California Arizona border is Yuma and so it's almost like you're you're going to take a road trip to Yuma basically <laughs> boulevard. <laughs> yeah and boulevards i mean if you're going to have large animals and there are there's another twilight safe haven is out there as well and they have horses are they boulevard they're in camp Campo. Okay. So those cities are, they're nice. Well, towns, they're nice to be able, because we, we, San Diego has just grown so much. There's really, it's really hard to find big open spaces to be able to accommodate animals like that. So that was a challenge for you because you, Lori, not only, I mean, anybody who's in animal rescue or running a sanctuary knows you can't just have that one job. People have multiple things that they're doing in order to to keep the animals alive and safe and healthy and also doing whatever work they need to do with the animal themselves. So you moved recently. One, can you just tell us a little bit about that that big move for you? Sure. We we needed to move closer into San Diego. We were commuting over an hour each each way, and because I'm a pet sitter, I was going to San Diego twice a day. So I was driving three 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 hundred fifty miles a day, and being gone for a lot of hours, wasting my time in traffic. It in time that I was being, I wasn't earning money and I was away from my animals. So, and I just, I wanted them to have, well, Boulevard is very deserty. There's not a lot of grass. There's a lot of like poisonous plants and such out there. And I just wanted not only to get closer into town for, for my commuting, I wanted to give them access to grass. Not there's still not a ton of it, but it's more than we had. But finding property that is enough for large animals has the correct zoning, which is vital for large animals. And the prices of of properties here is just out of sight. So it it took months and months and months for us to find a property that would work. So it didn't have any infrastructure at all. So everything uh, either had to be put together or brought in. So it's, it's a work in progress still, but they have a barn. So they have shelter and shade. And so it's coming together, but we still have some work to do. Do you get uh, the snow out where you are? That because I know you used to get a lot of snow. People don't think about it, but it does snow in Southern California. So I I know when Snowflake was born, it was like was it one of the first days that you had gotten? A, it was kind of a nice in March, snow. and it was snowing. Hence her name. Yeah. So yeah, we definitely got some snow and some really bad ice out in Boulevard. Because the elevation is about 4,000 feet. Where we are now in Dulzura, it's about 1,000 feet. So it does not snow, which makes me very happy. Yeah. So a couple of benefits. More grass, less exactly. snow. So yes. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I'm going to encourage people to look up gas prices in San Diego <laughs> County. So you lucky, lucky few that are only paying two something a gallon. I filled up my, this is, we're recording in late, last day of February, 2024, or second to the last day, because it's a leap year. And I filled up my gas tank yesterday and it was almost $5 a gallon. So it's, 
you know, that along with high prices of everything, not just property and gas, but taking care of your animals is always such a huge challenge. And, and I, animal people are very, very committed, but that's why so many rescues and sanctuaries and so on in this particular area are always struggling or have to close completely because they can't they just can't afford it anymore and you just you work and work and work and work and you just can't afford to keep things going um and yeah I'm glad you mentioned zoning because there are a lot of zoning issues people get these micro pigs I'm doing air quotes right now and they're not they don't say the they get big (laughs) and then somebody's got a pig living in their in their apartment that they they can't have so that's a problem just along the lines of what you were just saying about the high cost of everything for instance just everything is has like doubled it seems like since covid the prices of hay has just gone out of sight out in california it's between double or triple what it used to be when we moved back and then we 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 have we feed some of them grain. Uh, Augie has to have grain because I have to hide his medicine in it. So I have to make sure that we have a, always have a good supply of that. And just, I mean, there's so many things, the farrier costs, just making just any kind of vet visits, anything like that, it adds up. And I do this by myself. I, I put a lot of my, money that I bring home from pet sitting goes straight to my sanctuary. So I'm, I'm, I have some great donors that donate an amount each month, which is great because I can count on that money. But, you know, from month to month to month, I never know how we're going to do or how much of my own money I'm going to have to put in. And fundraising is hard. It's one of the hardest things I've learned to have to do in my life and it's just the money's not coming in and it's not just Libby Lou's there's like you said there's a lot of struggle out there with other sanctuaries that are having to rehome their animals or, or close entirely or thin the herd so to speak so any financial help that we can get it's tax deductible and every penny goes back to the animals. Nothing goes to me. It, it's all about them. So if you feel like you want to help us, we would be so grateful because we're we're struggling. And I mean, honestly, I don't know if we can stay in California long term. I, I, I don't know. I need to have a long range plan. But. I just don't know if things keep going the way they are. I don't know how we're going to be able to stay in San Diego. So just to get the word out that come out, visit with my animals. I I would like to start a volunteer program, but with my pet sitting schedule, I'm just unable to know exactly when I'm going to be home and for how long, but come out, have a tour, meet these animals face to face. Let me tell you their stories let let you I want you to learn that they're individuals. They have personalities. Cows are so much like dogs. They know their name. They play. They they're so similar to dogs and you need to see it for yourself. And really see what I'm doing. See how much I love these animals and if you want to help us that would be wonderful. So, I'm going to put your information in our show notes, but can you go ahead and Tell us your contact information, how to find you online, social media. Sure. And then how people can come out and visit you too. Yeah. Our website is Libby Lou's safehaven.com. We're on Instagram and Facebook. And I, I do tours on Sundays, weather permitting. We, I'm backlogged a bit now because of all the rain we've had. But I try to to do as many tours as I can. I I like to try to keep them small just to not overwhelm the animals because we do go in with them and and pet them and groom them if they're willing. They, of course, don't have to do anything they don't want to do. But yeah, you can reach me through the website. 
or on social media and just let me know what Sundays might work for you. And then hopefully you can come out and everybody and, and really learn. Like, for instance, cows don't have any upper teeth. How many of you knew that? <laughs> Stuff like that. Little fun facts. I know that now. Um, I can teach you about these wonderful <laughs> animals. So, and something I highly, highly recommend. I've, so like I mentioned earlier, I've been to Lori's property a number of times. And when they know when she's going to go get treats <laughs> and to see cows do like binkies jumping for joy because they know they're going to get a treat and and for those of you who have rabbits or gu guinea pigs popcorn rabbits binky you've seen dogs and cats get really excited about stuff cows do that too and it is such a joyful experience to be there and interacting with them when they are just like just so happy because they know mom's going to get them a treat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so, yeah, I mean, if you want to see that, it's on Animal Bond Academy, some of the episodes, but it, it's not the same as being there and actually watching them. I also learned when I went out there that cows hum, that every sound they make isn't just a moo and different vocalizations mean different things. So it's just really, it's a really cool experience to go out there. And it's closer to seeing. <laughs> yes. <so. laughs> well, thank you so much, Lori. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. I'll let you go so that you can go back and take <laughs> care of the cows and the donkeys and the chickens and you've got some dogs and <laughs> lots thank of other you. animals. So thank you, Lori, and we'll we'll talk to you soon. Ooh.